Welcome to The Traveling Professors. I'm Professor Bob. And I'm Professor Sherry. And together, we are The The Traveling Traveling Professors. Professors. Welcome to show number 92 of The Traveling Professors. Today, Sherry and I are going to take you on a tour of the Archaeological Museum of Naples. Now, I understand people go, well, the only reason we need to go to Naples is to see Pompeii. Well, that's not entirely correct. As a matter of fact, there's a real dilemma. When you go to see Pompeii, some of the objects that you see in Pompeii are actually reproductions. Not all of them, but some. For example, the mosaic of the Battle of Isis with Alexander the Great. No, it is not really in Pompeii. It's in the Archaeological Museum. And so when we went to visit Pompeii, we saw the city. And then the next day, we went to see the museum. And we felt that it would have been really beneficial to us had we done the museum first. Now, I'm obviously, and Sherry would back me up on this, suggest that if you're going to go to Pompeii, stay long enough in Naples to go to the Archaeological Museum, because this is one of those cases where this monstrous museum is full of all this art from Pompeii with explanations. It has stuff from Herculaneum. But then one of the neatest sections is the material from the Villa of the Papyri, which is just stunning. So make your way to the museum and enjoy it. But it is, I would spend the whole day there. We were there about eight hours, I think, and had lunch there and then had a late lunch later on. And we still missed a lot of the material. It was just overwhelming. So let's start our little tour. Now getting to the Museum of Archaeology is pretty easy. It's right on the main stretch of of Metro. You can get there from several different directions. So no matter where you stay, you can get there. And we just simply walked across the street to the Dante Metro and it's the next stop going north. Got out and walked to the museum. You could easily have walked from where we were as well. Here's a view of the museum from its exterior from across the street. And then here's a view of it as you're heading into the, the main entrance. And on the ground floor, you have all the amenities for the museum and what have you, but you have all of these other galleries and you get just an idea of the size of the galleries. They have art everywhere. They have some where they have uh, different displays that kind of move in and out. They have a coin collection from the ancient world. They have all kinds of different things. This room that you see here, this is part of the Villa of the Papyri. And it illustrates something that you have to be aware of when you go and visit a museum. For example, the two bronze statues that you see there are these two running boys. Well, when we arrived to see them, they'd run off. They were on tour somewhere. Uh, And I've been to Paris on several occasions and had to go to the Museum d'Orsay three times to finally see Olympia. So be aware of that. And of course, you will find little hallways like this where you have all sorts of different statues. There's lots of busts. And some of the busts here, it's the only place where they exist. The bust of Pyrrhus of Epirus is the only surviving bust from his time period. But again, you know, there's going to be a lot of statues. Some of them are going to be a lot are bronzes, which are really hard to find. And there's an old joke that when you've traveled to Rome or you've traveled to ancient places where you see statuary all over the place, people will say, well, when you were in Rome, what did you, what, what, did, what statue did you like the most? And the standard joke answer is the last one. But sometimes that's true after you've been through a museum like this all day. It's like, well, how do you pick out your favorite? And they had a nice courtyard, which of course had all sorts of different things scattered around in it. Had a little food court. They had all sorts of stuff. So that's the entrance into this magnificent museum. And this is the only map I'm going to show you of the museum. And it's the ground floor. So you see where the bathrooms are. You see the entrance and you see the blue area. The blue area is known as the Farinese Collection. And you see all of these halls and different rooms. Now, the Farinese Collection was created by Pope Paul III Farinese, who issued an edict that gave his family the right to excavate in order to obtain marble and stone with the exclusive claim to all sculptures for the construction and decoration of his main residence in Rome, which is known as the Palazzo Farinese. Today, it's the French Embassy. So this begins the collection of it. And the first object you're going to see, we walked all the way down to the end of this hall because it was so stunning. It's called the Veronese Bull. It was discovered in 1545 in the Baths of Caracalla. Now, the family eventually ended up with over 400 of these various types of statues and art from the old palace of, of Nero and from Caracalla's palace. So 
Here's a nice long hallway, which has, of course, all of this different art. And I'm just going to show you a few pieces. But let's walk down to see the Farinese Bull. And you can see how spectacular it is. Remember, this is carved out of one single block of marble. This is the front view of it. And then here's the side view of it. Now they found it in Rome and then they transported it down to Naples to be part of the one of the palaces they had there. Here's the back side. It gives you a good idea of the size of it compared to a human being. Now this has been restored frequently. And one of the first restorers was Michelangelo. He did some work on it for the Pope. And then here is the final side of the Veronese Bull. Just absolutely, unbelievably spectacular. Now we just start wandering through the various exhibits in the Veronese section. Here we have a statue known as the Two Tyrannicides of Athens. The gentleman you see here is Aristogenitor, who is there in person, but you notice there's somebody missing. There's supposed to be another statue that's harmonious. He's on vacation to another museum. Then we have the beautiful Ephesian art Artemis. And then here's a side view of her as well. Some people look at those and say, well, those are, are breasts. Uh, they're more than likely bull's testicles, uh, that, which would have been put on a rope and tied around her. This is known as maligar. Now, this is not propolite. This is red limestone from Rhodes. Now, this is a first century copy. The original was done in the fourth century BCE by Scopus of Peros. You'll have a lot of Roman art that is a copy of a Greek piece of art that no longer exists. This is Propholite, and this is Apollo with a lyre, and it's a 2nd century A.D. statue. And then we have Eros with a dolphin, and this is a little closer view of it from one side and then the back side of it. The Hellenistic Greeks loved dolphins, and so you'll find them all the time, particularly if you're around Ephesus. Now we come into a hall which is full of statues and busts, so here we have the statue of Agrippina, been sitting in whatever, more likely a palace. There's the back side of it. And then here we have good old Hadrian. Now Hadrian is an interesting statue. The body is another person. The head is Hadrian's. This is something that's very typical of Roman art during the Empire period. Is that is, they would have bodies and torsos and things, and the heads were interchangeable. So when you have a change of leader, you can change the head. And here we have two busts. The one on the left is Caracalla. That's a pretty famous one. If you had any history books from Rome, you usually see that. The other one is Septimus Cerevus. And then we end up with Homer. So this is a nice bust of Homer. This is a double-sided statue. You see two different people. And if you look at the two people, uh, the one on the right is Herodotus, and the one on the left is Thucydides, the two great historians. And then we come to Venus Calipagia, which means Venus with the beautiful buttocks, translated from Greek. It is an original one from the second century BCE. And then we go out and we have this magnificent stone sarcophagus. And it's supposed to show Hercules drunk in a procession to Dionysus. So here's one side of it. You kind of see Hercules in the middle, getting about ready to fall over. And then here is the other side of the sarcophagus. Well, now it's time to go up to the mezzanines and visit the Cabinet of Secrets, or the Secret Cabinet. And the way by, we pass these two beautiful bronze statues. One of them is the Emperor Augustus on the left, and the other is his wife Livia. And I don't believe Livia has ever been better portrayed. And then here we come to the magnificent staircase that leads you from the ground floor to the mezzanine level up to the first floor. I'll show you the statue on our way down because it's not ancient. When you get up there, one of the rooms is a coin room. And here you see basically a safe. They found this and inside of it was a lot of coinage. Here we see this solid silver bracelet. And when you talk about finding a hoard of money, here's an example. This was inside the chest, a hoard of gold Roman coins. They also found silver coins. And these are the Byzantine gold coins. They had a nice selection where they showed the different emperors and what the coins looked like. Well, here's what everybody's been waiting for. The Cabinet of Secrets. Here's the way it looks. Remember this, when this museum was built, this was quite risque. Well, Pompeii is a, it's a pleasure town. So there are brothels and all sorts of other things. And so it's a very erotic art all over the place. So when you go inside, you'll find various 
mosaic erotic art. Here's Sherry look exi- looking at some of them. And here's some of the tamer ones. And here we have a little nice male and female. And then at the end of the hallway, this is Venus and the Half Shell. This is the birth of Venus. Here we have a nice little couple in the room. There's Sherry down the end of the hall where Venus is, is behind her. And then eventually you turn through one section and you're in Penisocopia. Uh, these are various types of lighting with uh, flying penises. Actually, flying penises is, is a motif you find all the time for fertility. People used to wear necklaces with flying penises on them. Here we have uh, another one, a little close-up of it. Here we have a satyr propositioning a lady who appears that she's not going to be able to do much to turn him down. And then they have an example of what you might have found if you were going through Pompeii. You'd have streets where you would have these penises on them and other mosaics showing what various things might go on in there. So there's a lot of erotica going on in Pompeii. We are now entering one of the most valuable collections in the entire museum. These are mosaics from the House of the Fawn in Pompeii, which were excavated from 1830 to 1832. And they depict an Alexandrian palace. These are all, for the most part, uh, Hellenistic themes, particularly from Egypt. So this first one that you see, you see its size compared to the people in the room, is animals from the Nile. So when you get close-ups, you see the, the ducks and the mongoose, the cobra, the hippos. And then you see the alligators and more ducks. Then you go a little further, and then you come to the masterpiece. This is the Battle of Issus. And this original originally was painted for the Royal Macedonian Palace in Pella. And it's believed to be the work of the painter Helena, daughter of Timon. Now, there's other people who claim that They painted it as well. This is not a painting. This is a mosaic based on the painting. Because you actually find that painting on Etruscan artwork. Now this is gigantic. If we get a little closer to it, you see that this thing is almost 6 meters by 3 meters. The tesserae that they used to make this is so fine that there's 15 to 30 pieces of stone per square centimeter. So this painting, or this mosaic, has over a million tesserae. And then here's a closer view of the part where you see the Darius III in his chariot fleeing. And then here's the little piece with Alexander the Great getting ready to throw his spear. Now if you go to the House of the Fawn, you will see this in the garden. Well, it's a replica. It's not the original. But they they do that to preserve the very rarest. Then here you have the mosaics of the masks from the House of the Fawn. There's the length of it. And then here's a close-up of one of the masks. And this is a mosaic. All this is mosaic. And here we have another one with an interesting theme. A uh, winged person on the back of a lion. And then here's a way of of using mosaics and uh, columns. So you have this column here. You see it's made out of brick. Then they've stuccoed over it. And then they've begun to put mosaics on it. So here's a close view of the lower end and the upper end. Romans were really good at making columns look like they were a lot more expensive, but they had a a cheap brick inner core. So now we're going to leave this area and we're going to go down to the area where they have the uh, artifacts from the house of the Papyri. So we have to go back down the stairs. So here's the view going down the stairs towards the ground floor again. And here's the statue that I mentioned I talked about earlier. It looks like this spectacular Athena. It's not ancient at all. It was actually made by the artist Canova, and it depicts Ferdinand IV of Naples as Minerva, the goddess of war. So a little different. Now we're in a a magnificent collection of bronzes and other works of art, as well as a couple of really rare items. This is the this is the house of the Papyri, and it was outside of Pompeii and away from Herculaneum, so it didn't get the intense heat that Herculaneum had that literally melted everything. There is some melted glass here. But the bronze statues were able to survive and a lot of other work. So you come into the exhibit and the first thing you see is this beautiful Athena, which of course would have had a great spear in her hand. Then you come to four bronzes. They're known as Di- Dianides, the dancers. So there's four different dancers. So here's one of them. The eyes are just eerie. Here's another one of them. Here's the third one. And here's the fourth one. 
Now, if you remember from the beginning, I showed a picture of this room with the two running boys. Well, you can see that they've run completely off by the time we got there. And there was another statue that was missing as well. And while we were here, it was time to do a little dusting. So Athena got a dusting job. This gentleman came in with his ladder and dusted all of the statues that he couldn't reach from the ground. Then this bronze is called Ptolemy Appion. How in the world you cast that to get that hair is just incredible. Then here we have the bronze of Seleucus I, one of the generals that helped divide up the empire after the death of Alexander the Great. Then we have this bust of Sappho. And I've mentioned this gentleman before. Here's Pyrrhus. So here's Pyrrhus of Epirus, a little front and side view of him. And then you get to the reason why it's called the House of the Papyri. In this picture, you can't see it very well, but they found papyrus scrolls. Here's a closer view. You can see how thick it is. Now, of course, they've been charred, and the debate is how in the world can we read them? They tried to see if they could unpeel it. That didn't work. They've been using all kinds of scanners and computer programs to try and deal with it, and they're having a little bit of success. There's no telling what those could be. Then here's something that's unique, and that is a silver crater. And then inside the villa, they had pretty good plumbing. Here is the bronze plumbing that was utilized in the villa. You find this in Pompeii, you find it in other places. Sometimes it's lead. Then they had a display of glass. This is the glass room. And these are some of the pieces that managed to survive. Here's two nice ones with the handle on the green one. And then sometimes the you're not in the right spot. So here's what happens to that glass in the heat of the volcanic eruption out here at the at this place. And then here we have another one, a yellow one with the and then a beautiful clear with the two handles. And then for heaven's sakes, look at this incredible blackware with motif on it. And then we end up going into an area which has material from Pompeii. And so here we have an example of um, a man painted on a piece of glass that's then put into a, a circle and used as ornamentation. And then you have all of these paintings from the walls of different buildings. Now I want you to notice the one that's directly over the head of Sherry. That one is this one right here, which is a very famous work that you find in most books. This is the woman with her stylus and her book to write on. And then this is also one of the paintings. And then here's Sherry in one of the rooms and brought the walls into the museum. And then here's another very famous work that you'll find in uh, various art books. And then this is one that I particularly liked, which is the one with the Roman galley on the front of it. You see the battering ram. And then we went down and got a little something to eat in the cafeteria and wandered around the courtyard. Here I am standing next to one of the gods in his godlike size, I might add. And then it was time to go back, middle of the afternoon now. And so we go down to the metro station to pick up the metro. And we get back to our Dante Palazzo and decided then a little bit later on that um, we were still hungry. So we walked through the gate here, about by where the tower is, where the clock is, and ended up a couple of blocks away in this area. Notice the big gaping hole down below here. Well, this is what it is. This is part of the wall fortifications of the original Greek city of, uh, of Naples. The city of Magna Graecia of Naples extended out quite a distance from the, from the port. And then here's the little restaurant that we usually had lunch, lunch at. This is where we had a nice lunch. We took an evening meal here as well. And it was really funny. We were like the oldest couple there. Everybody else was um, mid-twenties and something like that. And there was a group of girls that came in and they sat. And then every, each one's boyfriend showed up at a different time. And when the boyfriend would show up, they would all get up and dance. It was really fun. We had a great time with them. Sherry and I hope you enjoyed the tour. Please come by our YouTube channel at Bob Packett. And please subscribe and leave some comments. Thank you very much. I've been doing podcasting on history for over 15 years. I've got over 4,000 shows and I've done CDs, which of course can be sent out as USBs. So if you would really like to get more on history for free, then come by my website, as you see here, historyaccordingtobob.com and see what's there. So thank you very much again.